Hello everyone, welcome. Welcome to Interior Tzu's Salon for Zionist Thought. I'm Doug Altebeff, the chairman of the board of Interior Tzu, and this is a very special day for me. It's a thrill, it's a pleasure to have as my guest, an old friend, uh, a man who I would say embodies the passion, the joy, the awareness of what it means to be here in the land of Israel. And as you will hear from Yishai Fleischer, uh, he is not just in the land of Israel, but he is in ground zero in the land of Israel, in the community of Hebron, where he is a very active uh, international spokesman and development officer, and also working on behalf of the Hebron Fund, which we at Imtir Tzu are pleased and proud to have a wonderful association with over the years. So welcome, welcome. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank to you, have Doug. You. Thank Great you. Great to be with you here. And uh, let's start with you. How did you get to be the Yishai Fleischer that we know about today? As usual, it comes from the parents. Uh, my parents were uh, refuseniks, Russian refuseniks. Mm -hmm. uh, and people of your generation fought to get the people of my parents' generation uh, out of the Soviet Union. And they were behind uh, that, uh, those, th that, that, that closed off country. People so this is the early 90s, right? No. Before that, that first generation, yeah, they the were, early my 70s. Parents, my, exactly. My parents ah. got out in 72. Wow. wow 72. Wow, wow. They okay. were some of the first. Very good. Uh, and Second. they were some of the first to push that whole agenda. Uh, and they remember all the efforts of, uh, that American Jewry yes. made in order to, to free Russian Jewry. Uh, I think sometimes I think that that's one of the crowning achievements of American Jewry. Yes. You know, uh, that, that movement to get the Russian Jews out. So, um, 72, they came to Israel and they lived here in Israel for many years. And then for economic and other reasons, they moved to America. Uh, mm -hmm. And in America, immediately I felt that, that I was going to, I had to go back to the homeland. Uh, and serve in the army. And when I got to be 17 years old, that's what happened. I went to yeshiva and then I went to the army. I left America by myself and I came back here by myself and I spent a lot of years uh, here as a lone soldier. Um, and, um, but another thing happened along the way was that we found more Judaism in America. We were, my parents were Russian Jews, uh, but they were not plugged into Yiddishkeit, Judaism. Mm -hmm. But as often happens, not always, some people assimilate out, but other people yearn for that Jewish connection mm -hmm. and then turn away from Israeliness and turn more towards Jewishness mm -hmm. in America. And that's what happened to us. And they sent me to Jewish school and I took to it. I took to it. I, I found it to be exciting and, and uh, I believed in God. And, and but I, you melded your Jewishness with your, with your Israeliness by coming yeah. back here. Well, t to, me, to me, that's a... It's actually not so, so complex. It actually mm -hmm. seems obvious. Right. We're a peoplehood. We have a Torah. We have a homeland. Right. And our homeland is the most exciting part of the story since uh, we've been waiting for this opportunity to mm -hmm. resettle and rebuild our homeland uh, for a long time. And so to me, it was just exciting. I, I, you want to be part of it. You don't want to miss it. Mm -hmm. it's like, that's sometimes my argument with some uh, American Jews. I just say to them, don't you want to be where the action is? Mm. Forget like everything else. Just, that's where the action is, it's hot. Mm -hmm. And speaking of where the action is, how did you get involved with Hebron? Well, it, it took a few steps, it took a few steps. Uh, the first step was that it, I, I finished the army in yeshiva and I went back to America, mm. to yeshiva university. Mm. My father came to me in Israel and he said, listen, you have a sister and brother growing up without you. Come, come back to America mm. for a few years. And I went to Yeshiva University and then I stayed there for Cardoza Law School. Mm. Now, when I was at Yeshiva University, I had just been to the army in Israeli yeshiva, and I was surprised how little Israel had an impact in New York City for New York Jews and Yeshiva University. Mm -hmm. And this prompted me to start a pro-Zionist organization. That was the first thing that I, that I started doing. It was called Kuma, which means Arise. And uh, that was an Aliyah organization that we started the last year of college. And we kept pushing that stuff uh, for a long time in New York City. And really, a lot of people that are my friends here today in Israel are products of that push mm. back then. So I was, uh, I was in New York City, and I was, I was pushing Aliyah and Zionism. And then we were at law school. And at the law school, we were planning to, uh, uh, I planned to go back to Israel. Um, and then uh, my father passed away. And then Arutz Sheva 
Israel National News, Israel National Radio reached out to me and said, you know, uh, this was through Providence, you know, do you want a job with us? And if you want a job, you got to make it out here to Beit El. I'm like, where is that? <laughs> Never even heard of that. <laughs> and, uh, and connected with Beit El and with Arut Sheva, who gave me that first start. And they wanted me to be the head of their radio station. And so I was there, and that started me on the awareness of another issue, which is Jewish rights in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Oh, at law school, I met a girl. And uh, that girl's name was uh, Melissa at the time. Later, she became Malka. Uh, and uh, that girl, we decided to get married. And we came to Israel, to Hebron, to the Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matriarchs, to get married there. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of the connection mm -hmm. specifically with Hebron. But at Sheva, I learned a lot of the issues of, Ju of the rights of Jews in Judea and Samaria. And I learned the players. Who were the players? Who were the, who were the, and you know, I see behind you there's a picture of uh, Mordechai Kedar. Mm -hmm. uh, other players, people like that who were just part of the, the, the scene. Uh, and I, and I, I learned the lingo, I learned the issues. And so I became, you know, I, I became versed in a few different tracks. One is to spread Judaism. Another one is to is spread Zionism, but especially Jewish rights in the land of Israel, and, and calling American Jewry and other Jewry to come be part of it one way or, another, or the other. Many of our viewers are very aware of our Sheva because it is the consistently reliable pro-Zionist media outlet right. uh, for English speakers, also in Hebrew, right. of course. But uh, I have the... Uh, pleasure of writing uh, for them, as do you occasionally, and uh, they, they do a great job. You know, it turns out that media is very important because it's, it's almost like the food that you eat. It's what you consume yeah. daily. So for me, uh, IsraelNationalNews.com is absolutely key. I also like JewishPress.com, mm -hmm. and I like JNS.org, my good friend Alex Trayman, my mm -hmm. good friend uh, JNS.org, at Stephen Levitt at, uh, at JewishPress.com. These guys are doing great work, right. and they're helping people. And I, I push that on my podcasts right. and my stuff because right. people need to, to consume good, healthy right. media. Okay, well, we're going to touch on that, but I want to focus a, a bit on Hebron itself because at some point, besides your wedding, you did gravitate to Hebron. You became ensconced in Hebron. And Hebron is uh, a major, major, major focus for the Jewish people. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. Give, give our uh, viewers a sense of not only the historic importance of Hebron, but the current importance of Hebron, and what it means for the Jewish people. Historically speaking, Hebron is the first purchase of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Abraham purchased the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs. That is the first recorded purchase 3,700 years ago. It's very important, uh, and just on that level. Uh, then it is the place where the founders of our peoplehood are buried. So that's Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah. Leah. Uh, Rachel, Rachel, is buried at the tomb of Rachel. That's a story. But the point is, is that the Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matriarchs in Hebron is this place that is the uh, shrine of Jewish peoplehood. Yeah. Uh, later, Caleb comes there and is against the other spies and uh, brings back a positive report. Finally, King David rules in Hebron for seven years before he moves to Jerusalem. After being crowned <laughs> king of all of Israel in Hebron, he moves to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. but, but Hebron is, uh, it was, is the first capital of Israel. Hebron is the place where uh, instead of the shrine where you connect to God, it's the shrine where you connect uh, in Jerusalem, it's the shrine where you connect to the peoplehood. Mm -hmm. That's in Hebron. Uh, and well, excuse me, what you said is very, very important. Abraham has prom promised the land of Israel not necessarily to be realized in his lifetime. It isn't, as we know. But what he does in his lifetime on his own initiative is to purchase a piece of the land of right. Israel. And that becomes, if, if I'm right, something of, uh, of a role model for uh, how we have settled this land. We have not waited for it to just be bestowed upon us, but we have taken an active role in purchasing, in, in settling, in moving into and in building the land ourselves. Right. There's sometimes you battle for the land and sometimes you just settle the land. Uh, but the purchase is a, there's no, there's no, there's not going to be any disagreement. Mm -hmm. The previous people sold it. 
And uh, the sages say that, they're, that, that, that the forefathers purchased three plots on the land of Israel, and that was Abraham purchased in Hebron, uh, Jacob purchased in Shechem, mm -hmm. in Nab, so-called Nablus, uh, and David purchased on the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and these are key holds in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Three positions, Hebron, Shechem, mm -hmm. Shechem, in the center of Jerusalem. And if you hold on to these three, you're really holding on to the, to the land of mm -hmm. Israel. Uh, mm -hmm. Hebron is also seen, Hebron, uh, unlike other places, Hebron has had continuous Jewish presence throughout the land. 1540, a great synagogue was built uh, in, in, in Hebron. And Jews lived in Hebron throughout all these times until the 1929 riots, right. which are really a preamble to the Holocaust. Yes. Okay? Yeah. And, and, uh, and Jews are kicked the out. Mufti. Starring the Mufti, uh, Haj Amin al Husseini. And, um, and he was an evil man. He was the predecessor of, of Yasser Arafat had that same way of thinking, uh, created the idea of Palestinian nationalism in order to uh, effectuate ethnic cleansing of the Jews. Yes. And he was a big devotee of Hitler. Yes. And, and, and in fact, there are stories that he uh, lobbied heavily with Hitler to think about an extermination of the Jews in the Middle East, uh, as well as the ones in Europe. So Right. Well, he, he actually ki helped kill 40,000 Jews in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. He basically went to Europe and became a mufti of the, the Muslim Nazis. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, he had a plan to create an extermin extermination camp in Dotan, which is northwest of Shechem. And they, mm -hmm. the plans have been found and, and, and the documents have been uncovered. The bottom line is when the British stopped Rommel at El Alamein, it was very important because ha had they not stopped him, mm. the Nazis would have, yes. would have planned that uh, right. extermination camp. So Hebron has great significance, and I would argue, and I think you would agree, that it has great significance for all Jews, not necessarily just observant Jews, not necessarily uh, aware Jews, but it is really very much a part of our birthright, of our heritage. Um, so how can in, in some ways, in some ways, Hebron is even more geared towards a person who's not connected to the Bible or to Jewish law or observancy. So let's talk about that. How? Because it's nationalism. It's, yeah. it's the peoplehood. Okay. So so I'm I'm a secular guy living in Haifa, where you were born, uh, and I will tell you that M Tier Two regularly brings busloads of tourists, students mostly to Hebron who have never been there before to get tours from the likes of Yishai Fleischer and his compatriots. Uh, and they're blown away. They're, they're deeply affected by Hebron. So what is that, that tie to, that all of us can participate in, can take part in? You know, uh, you, you know Doug, as a thinker, I, I really like to reduce things to simple, to simple phrases. Mm -hmm. it, it's really simple. It's, it's just Jewish history. Jewish history has happened there for the last 3,800 years. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. Abraham lived there and the forefathers lived there and then Jews kept living there. Mm -hmm. uh, some time ago, before I was working for Hebron, Peace Now came to protest in Hebron to try to ethnically cleanse the Jews from there. Mm -hmm. So I, I, was, I was just, uh, I think I was working at Arut Sheva and I, I came there with posters. I had to decide what to make in the posters. I could have put anything on the posters. But I wrote, Abba Kavur Po, father is buried here. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, Ima Kavur Po, mother is buried here. Mm -hmm. And the next day, that was on the front page of Haaretz. Because mm -hmm. that was the message. It's mm -hmm. like, this is Jewish history. This is where we're from. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you're from, if you're, if you're observant. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Because if you believe in Jewish peoplehood, or you believe in history, or you believe in di indigeneity, you can connect to this place and be like, wow, you know? Like Jewish people have lived yes. here and have been an ethnic majority or at times an ethnic minority, but they're from this town. They're from this place. It's tied into our very narrative DNA. Right. And the people who live in Hebron today, the community, are very aware people, very plugged in people. Of course, they are demonized as settlers. You know, this is the, uh, the negative term of art. But um, why is that? What are they doing? They're doing something very important on behalf of the rest of us. Uh, and uh, give us a sense of the, the strength of the current Jewish community in Hebron. Well, the people that showed up there are, are quite ideological. Uh, and they were the first. One, there was another one, at the same time, with the Sebastia and the Samaria people, but 
basically Hebron was, was really the first push towards the rights of the Jewish people to re-inherit the land after the Six Day War. You know, the government got all this land in the Six Day War, but they didn't know exactly what to do with it. Should we give it back for peace? Or should we, or should we take it up? Mm-hmm. And there were Jews that were said, it's time to go back and, and get these, this is the heart of our heartland. This is, the, this is the place where we're from. Our forefathers and mothers didn't know about Tel Aviv. They knew about Hebron. They knew about Beit El. They knew about, uh, you know, so-called East Jerusalem, i.e. Jerusalem. Uh, and so, so uh, they, they moved down there and they were very ideological. And they still ideological. You know, I'm always amazed. The children of the generation that, that settled Hebron, resettled, right, uh, are all in the, in the tough places, and settling the land, they, they, get, they really got that ideology yeah. very strongly. Uh, and, and we've also faced a lot of very tangible terror and hate and, and, yeah. and violence. And so the people also had to have physical courage, not just ideological courage, not just discomfort because you didn't have hot water in the shower, but also really facing bullets and stabbings. And, and the enemy was very uh, set on trying to get rid of us from there, still are. Uh, today, in a different form, they have a different way of operating, uh, but they, they tried very much in the beginning to completely just terrorize the community, and they stuck it out. And I always say, if we were Christians, if we were Christians, we're not. But if we were, we'd be called Knights of the Machpelah, mm-hmm. Knights of the Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matriarchs. We're the community that, yeah. goes, that goes, buttresses the Tomb of the Patriarchs and yeah. Matriarchs and stays put there. The demonization is a very popular uh, sport demonization of the Jewish community, their demonization of the idea that, that Jews are in Hebron. Uh, there are tours regularly given, as you well know, by Breaking the Silence that uh, are designed to show that somehow this Jewish community has usurped the poor Palestinians. What they never do is to do what you do, which is to take tour groups up to the top of the highest building in Jewish Hebron so that you see Muslim Hebron. That's right. And so you see a city of a quarter of a million people and what you realize is what the Jewish community is is the flea on the tail of the dog. It right. ain't the dog. Right. All right. There is a very big dog right next door. But this is all part of an attempt to distort, to delegitimize. And how do you deal with that? Well, uh, let, let's, let's t- when you started explaining, let's take that analysis just one step further. Uh, one, uh, meaning broader, and then we bring it back to Hebron. Uh, one of the things that they've managed to do, the anti-Israel uh, narrative warriors, is what they've managed to do is they've managed to create an idea that Israel is not fighting with the Arab world, it's fighting with small Palestine. So it's not tiny Israel amongst uh-huh. 22 Arab countries. It's big, you know, mechanized Israel against organic, natural, people of the land, Palestine. Mm. So that reframing has been very successful for them. It's, it's fake, it's faux, you know, and, and we, have, we still have regional enemies, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah armed by Iran, and we have still threats from, you know, from Syria, and, and, and uh, we, have, we have jihadist threats even in, in Jordan and abroad in Iraq and ISIS and, and, and from Africa. We, we have a lot of these threats, but the regional picture has been erased by people that want to redraw it and make, the, they, they're reversing the David and Goliath yes. narrative. That's their right. thing. Now, the same thing for Hebron. We're a tiny community of about a thousand Jews amongst 250, 220,000 Arabs, uh, most of whom are Hamas. There's a big Hamas presence. Uh, you're right, the city itself is 20 square kilometers. And here's another weird part of it all it's a very wealthy city, mm. it's one of the wealthiest cities. So, the way that the anti Israel narrative folks do it is that they'll give you a tour within the Jewish ghetto. Right. Show you a closed Arab store. Right. Oh, they've yeah. been displaced. And they've been displaced <laughs> and the whole thing. Now, now, all you have to do is, is have a you know, bird's eye view and you're like, wait a minute. Right. The Jewish community is a tiny defended ghetto. Yeah. And this brings me to one more point, which is we have to be able to say the truth and say it clearly. Israel is an armed ethnic minority in the region. An armed ethnic minority. That's what we are. Yes, our country is relatively successful, but what it is still is an armed ethnic minority in a big Arab region. 
Yeah. Thank God there are Arabs coming around now. There's the Abraham Accords, which I'm a big fan of. But still, Israel is an armed ethnic minority. So too are Jews of Hebron. We're an armed ethnic minority uh, trying to succeed and, 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 and thrive in a, in a city where our forefathers and mothers are buried, where, where our history uh, is found. And we have to just kind of say it for what it is. Uh, and the anti-Israel narrative is trying to flip it make us into the aggressive majority trying to destroy the life mm. of, of an indigenous minority. The community knows that they are doing something very important on behalf of Am Yisrael. They are yeah. maintaining continuity, they are keeping the faith, so to speak, they are keeping the torch lit of the Jewish connection to Hebron and Hebron's ability to animate us. That's right. So um, the community has had a couple of nice achievements recently in terms of getting some approvals for more building. Tell us a little bit about that. Israel's uh, p polity, uh, the citizenship, is moving more towards the religious and to the nationalist. And so our governments are reflective of that. And with time, uh, we are seeing more and more recognition of the centrality of places like Hebron to our tradition and really to the foundations of Israel. You know, you know people don't think about that, but Israel is, its whole proof for its right is based on its history. Yeah. So Hebron, Hebron is a key exhibit a. pillar. Exactly, exhibit a, exactly. <laughs> and by the way, Sharon, at the end of his life, Ariel Sharon, Prime Minister Sharon, said, I made a mistake. I focused too much on security and not enough about narrative in our history and our, and our rights. He said, and I should have taken people to Hebron. He, he, he told that to mm -hmm. Ari Shavit. Um, what was the question exactly you said? Well, the, I'm asking about some of the recent developments ah, that's in right. terms of that's new right. construction and that's new right. development. Well, one piece of development, which, which I didn't think would be such a big deal, but I'm, I'm being thanked for every day, is yeah. the elevator. The elevator. We have an elevator now into the uh, hall ah, of the, yes, yes, uh, yes, right. uh, the Tomb of the Patriarchs and the Matriarchs. And a lot of people, have, I saw uh, some, a couple came in the other day and they told me, they said, we've been waiting for this for mm -hmm. years. And they came in, she was in a walker and mm -hmm. he was with a cane. And, and, and so just that has been a big political achievement, it took a long time to do that. Uh, furthermore, uh, we've gotten the right to develop a Jewish property from, that's been owned by Jews for 200 years. And we're now developing 31 apartments. It's called, uh, it's called Rova Chizkia, the Chizkia Quarter and the Chabad neighborhood. It's got two names because of its history. Uh, and we're actually, um, we're actually selling apartments for the first time. So 31 apartments probably means you can grow the population by a good 15% or so, right? That's, that's right. We, uh, we, uh, we have um, even more, even yeah. more. Uh, we Depending have, on the size yeah, of the families who are coming we have, in. We, it's it's going to certainly be a big increase that's great. Uh, for, uh, uh, for the Jewish community. And I think our website is uh, myhebron.co.il and people could uh, really purchase mm -hmm. uh, an apartment. It's very exciting and it's in Tabu. It is recognized as, as land owned by Jews in, uh, in uh, what's it called, in title. Yes. And so that's very exciting. And there are many other uh, achievements we, we're pushing forward. And, and we're very excited about that, and it's good to focus on the good. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, I must say that the enemy is not asleep, and the Fayyad plan, which means that the Palestinian movement wants to build around Jewish communities and choke them, uh, is in full swing. Mm -hmm. And they build very quickly with PA uh, assistance. And so uh, the Jewish community is, is doing and is building, but at the rate that we're building and the rate that they're building, uh, they're, they're building faster. Are they, are they building illegally? Is that why it's faster? Or are they so heavily funded yeah. by the EU that uh, they, money's not an issue? Their, their whole building is, is political building. Yeah. It, the word illegally doesn't fit because the PA, which is the de facto ruler, sadly, our, our, our country, gave away parts of the sovereignty of the heartland of Israel to the enemies of Israel. You yeah. know, when I'm on an airplane, Gentiles, Goyim, the nations, turn to me and they say to me, like, why do you give your land away to your enemies? Yes. Why would you do that? Yeah. So, so the simple analysis is, that's just dumb. Don't give your land away to your right. enemies. When I said illegally, I was referring to parts of air, uh, Area C yeah. that are technically under our domain. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure there is, and of course there is a lot of illegal construction going on in Area C. The, the, they are on a very, the, 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 the PA is on a serious battle to take away all of Judea and Samaria mm -hmm. from Israel. Mm -hmm. And Israel's response is 
uh, mixed, yeah. mixed. That's you, being kind. Right, that's being kind. Uh, you know, we have very strong uh, a nationalist camp that is trying to hold onto the land and settle it. We have amazing farmers and these right. youth, these shepherds. You know, they're, they're just heroes. Uh, but, but, but at times they're treated as criminals and the international, the, the p- parts of the international community, you know, the, the part that, the, let's call the Euro, what I call, what I call the Euro Jihad Axis, mm-hmm. Western Europe Jihad Axis, they are funding <clears throat> the land grab on the other side, the Palestinian mm-hmm. land grab, and they are besmirching uh, the Jewish claims to the land. Yes. Well, part of the uh, besmirching is this very negative term, settler. Mm-hmm. Settler connotes a an occupier, a usurper, someone who was moved in to take something that's not really their own. Right. And uh, I want to just go back to you for a minute. You said something very interesting, and that is that the children of the uh, Hebron community basically are brought up with a spirit of uh, moving into difficult places and, and planting the flag and doing important work. It seems to me that you yourself have learned and, and you, you have, have branched out from your experience with Hebron to become what I would call a key uh, influencer about Judea and Samaria at large and uh, talking about, as you just did a minute ago, some of the key uh, pressures that we are facing in Judea and Samaria. Uh, it's, it's remarkable, and I'm sure many of our visitors, uh, viewers rather, have, have experienced this firsthand. You drive around in the Shomron, and you meet amazing people, incredible people, and, and you know, you'll read about the, the evil settlers, the Nas. These are people who are the backbone of the Jewish people. That's right. And, and so there is such a disconnect and it's, and it's to our shame, our collective shame, that we do not uh, honor these people for, right. for their role, for their efforts, for their bravery, uh, their s- steadfastness. Uh, you know a lot more about Beit El than you did when you first went there, I'm sure. There are a lot of communities that I'm sure you have been exposed to based on your uh, experience with Hebron. Give us a sense of what the mood of the people is in, uh, as you see it, in, uh, in Judea and Samaria? First thing, their mood is better than the people in Tel Aviv for one simple reason, the weather is much better, right? <laughs> the, 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 the Jews that we talk about, Judea and Samaria, it's important to understand that it's mountainous area. Yeah. And it's, the, it's, in, it's, it's a mountain region within the center of the country. And, and an interesting thing, when you stand, I was just uh, on Shabbat at Har Bracha, uh, community of Harbracha, uh, and at my friends uh, Hayovel, the organization. That yeah, brings Tommy Waller. Tommy Waller, which brings uh, yeah. Christian volunteers to Israel, and the view from there is just is it's just breathtaking. Right. And another thing that happens there is that you see the coastal plain so clearly below yeah. you. And if you have any sense of military strategy, a strategy, strategy. <laughs> if you have even the tiniest sense of it, right. you're like this high point right. controls that low point. Right. Why would I ever give right. this away? But when you're on the Tel Aviv beach and you turn around and you see those mountains far away, you're like, those mountains are, who, who knows what's over there? Yeah, you know? Who needs them? Yeah, right. who needs that? It's like a right. mess over there, right. you know? Right. And it's, that's, that, it's just that visual is exactly uh, correspondent to uh, the different feelings that we have. Like when you're, when you're on those mountaintops, you're like, I am Israel. We need to control this. I protect the lowlands. Mm-hmm. And of course, the history is here, and the spirituality is here on this mountain range. Um, but sadly, today uh, there are people who don't understand that. I, I think I think the truth is is that things are going in the right direction, and that's actually one of the causes of the big rift that's happening in Israel today. The problem is things are going in the right yes. direction, and the folks on the secular left, or right. let's call it post-Zionist, yes. Not everybody, people get very uh, offended. Not everybody on the secular yes. left is post-Zionist, but I'm talking, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I'm do. talking about the post-Zionist uh, 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 hard left is realizing that the country is moving towards the nationalist and towards the right and towards the religious, yes. uh, the traditional, and they're freaking out yes. because their country is evolving into what Israel was always going to yes. be. 
which was a state, the Jewish 51st state. The first state. <laughs> or, uh, well, to them, they want us to be Denmark. Right, uh, a Euro state. Yeah. That's right. And, and we want this to be the Jewish state, That's the right. Jewish state. That's right. And I was at a rally, and Imtir Tzu's Matan Peleg was speaking. And he started, he spoke, you know, everybody speaks, but then he started to chant. And he said, Ha'am rotze medina yehudit. Yeah, yeah. The, the nation wants a Jewish state. Yes. And that's become yeah. really the, the yeah. tension in Israel. You, you know, viewers, you, you, you need to know that as Ishai and I are talking, last night there was a huge uh, pro-government, pro-reform demonstration in Tel Aviv. And... What many people, particularly in Chutz Laaretz, uh, in the diaspora, don't understand is that these demonstrations, pro and con, are not really about judicial reform. They are about exactly what, what Yishai has been talking about, and that is the direction of the country, whose country is this anyway, who's going to be leading the country, uh, and when you have three religious parties who are part and parcel of the coalition, it, it freaks out a lot of people, secular people, because they feel like, oh, we're becoming a theocracy, all right, which is, of course, an absurdity. We're not, no one's interested in telling other people how, what they can do, what they can't do. But that is the fear out there. Judicial reform has been like a Pandora's box, which having opened up, is exposing a lot of much deeper seated uh, rifts, and and you those rifts are very clearly uh, perceived in terms of the perception of Judea and Samaria, yeah. for example. Yeah, uh, uh, there's definitely. That, I think I think your explanation is, is is right on, and I think that that's and I think that anybody who thinks that we're only talking about the uh, mechanics of judicial reform uh, and that's what the, the the fight's about is really seeing a very topical uh, and very superficial uh, understanding. There's a much deeper rift here. Uh, and and I even, I even, even I'm not even sure that it's, that it's even specifically about becoming a theocracy. I think, I think that there's a, I think people have an identity, they identify Israel a certain way, and suddenly Israel's looking differently, mm -hmm. and it's a brand. They're, they're not, that's not my brand. That's right. Yeah, that's not my brand. Right. And, and people, people have this, you know, and, and they just want to fight for their brand. Uh, I believe that that's very important. Uh, to fight for it. To, to, I have nothing against, by the way, the Tel Aviv brand. I have no problem with Israel, the high-tech country, the startup nation. I got no problem with our military prowess, and I have no problem with our, you know, with our financial prowess. I also don't have any big problem, mostly, with our liberal, uh, in the classic term, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 way of seeing the value of every individual human being and individual rights. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, but this is still a Jewish state. I don't want to see. Uh, this become a state of all its immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to see this become a the first Arab democracy or a 23rd Arab state. I don't want to see that. This is a Jewish state for the Jewish people. And right. there's nothing wrong with having uh, a national right. ethnic peoples uh, on their homeland. Right. There's nothing wrong with having, as we have historically been, a big tent. Uh, that the Jewish people are a big tent. But I think that you're right. And I think that you're right in the to to prioritize the importance of seeing all of this within the context of Israel remaining a Jewish state right. and 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 what a remarkable experiment this is what a remarkable adventure this is that we have had the blessing after 2000 and years to come back here and to have sovereignty to have control to have dominion over our ancestral homeland and to make a go of it. And, uh, you know, there are people who will say, we ain't doing such a good job. And, and, and there's a lot to say about that. But what I do notice is that people like Yishai, people like uh, the pro-government demonstrators, people like myself, we are very sensitive about the integrity of the social fabric in this country. We are not interested in winning if it means tearing the social fabric up. That's, that's true, uh, but sometimes you have to have a caveat. You, know, you have to have a caveat, which is, it's still the Middle East. Sometimes you've got to let the elbows come out. You, gotta be, you, can't, you can't always back down around here. Abs be, absolutely right. 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 Absolutely. Like, I, like, I, like, I don't want a civil war, but a civil push 
is yeah. maybe okay. Well, you know, because right now there are situations where we're being pushed around, and in the, in Israel, one of the great sins is not to be a sucker, a friar. Right. You know, and you have to be careful about that. Right. Um, so our silent majority is not silent anymore, right. and that's what Yishai is basically right. saying is it's very important to show up. You can't have one team on the field That's right. and have a game. That's right. You have to have but at the teams. same time, I tell you that I feel that uh, we are still missing. I, 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 I still feel that the judicial reform fight is, is, is a bit of a fake. Like it doesn't want to talk about the real issues behind it. Like I, I think that one of the biggest issues uh, is, um, is um, biblical consciousness. And I don't mean religious consciousness. I'm talking about identification with the places. The reason I love Hebron is because I read the stories of the Bible of Hebron. It touched my heart. And, and I really feel that it's really missing. You know, Doug, when you lived in New York, did you ever go to Renaissance fairs? Did you ever, did you ever yes, go on this? Yes, yeah. right, right, right. So yeah. my, my parents used to take me to Renaissance yeah. fairs, and I found them to be amazing. Not that I cared so much about the Renaissance. They've had them here. They have them in the north where okay. I Okay, but we, do we have a Bible fair? Yeah. Do we have a biblical fair yeah, where we no. could feel like we're putting on biblical clothing and, when, and, and, and it got that, have that feeling? No, we don't, we, we're not using our brand enough. Mm -hmm. And our brand, we have to help people fall in love with the brand of a wow. biblical Israel. Beautiful. Yeah. And apropos of that, we're going to wrap it up on this. You had told me that you're very enamored of this idea of creating the biblical highway. Right. Tell us about that. Well, the biblical highway exists. Right. Uh, it's just got to be but marketed it's, it's and branded as such. Labeled. As right, such. labeled as such. And that is a road that we have, the heartland road of the Jewish people. It's one road that connects, uh, it goes over the ridge of Judea and Samaria, but also connects Beersheba in the south, uh, the Jezreel Valley in the north. It's one road, it's called Route 60. Uh, you remember in America they used to have a show called Route 66, yes, yeah. right? And there's this famous heritage highway. Right. Uh, we have one road like that. It is an amazing road. It goes from Beersheba to Hebron, from, Hebr <laughs> from Hebron to Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, right. from there to Jerusalem, from there to Beit El, from there to Shiloh, from there to Shechem, from there to the Jezreel Valley uh, and the Tavor. And so uh, this one road we have is such an amazing thing. So I'm bringing an American idea, which is like the road. Right. It's not just the places on the road, but the road itself. Right. And so we are working right now to rename it officially, uh, Route 60, the Biblical Highway, or in Hebrew, Derech HaTanach. Uh, and uh, parts of the government are very excited about that. The mayors uh, along the way are excited about that. Uh, David Friedman uh, was, got excited about that and, and made a movie that's coming out in September, which is with Mike Pompeo along the Biblical Highway. That's what it's called, Route 60, the Biblical Highway. Uh, he bought it, uh, you know, he, he, he's, he's, yeah. a, he's, a, he's a brand ambassador yeah, yeah. Uh, of the it's Biblical Highway. It's a great idea. And, it's, and it's, a, it's not hard to conceptualize. Well, you know, Avraham went from Hebron, right. to Beersheba to Hebron and back and forth. And, right. and all of those places along the way that are found in the Bible, it's, it's just great. Uh, before we go, how can people, regular people, good people, get involved? I want a tour of Hebron. I want to see Hebron. Who can I meet? How can, uh, what, what should they know about? Uh, I'm very proud that the Hebron Fund has a fabulous tour schedule, which we really offer once or twice a week, English language tours from Jerusalem. We pick you up. We, we bring you there safely uh, and comfortably. And you really get to see Hebron, you get to see the Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matriarchs. We also go to Tomb of Rachel along the way. We tell you the story, the, the great uh, Rabbi Simcha Hachbam uh, leads yeah. the tours usually. And so, so all you do is you go to hebronfund.org, you go to the tour, and, and that makes all the difference for us. You know, before you, anybody even supports us, we want them to come and see it yeah. and feel it. And that's the best way. Uh, so that's hebronfund.org. Hebronfund.org. Don't forget that. That's right. And having, having been an alumnus of that tour, it is a must uh, experience. And, and if people want to stay in touch with me, I put out a podcast every week, uh, which includes Israeli politics, Israeli culture, a little uh, a time talking with my <laughs> wife, which is, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> people like the energy there. It's like Regis and Kathy Lee type right. of thing. Uh, and that's at yishaifleischer.com. Uh, and we do a lot of work throughout. We do a lot of work of beautification, uh, of narrative war, um, of Hebron, and, uh, and strengthening people in this time where they need strengthening. Wonderful. Yishai Fleischer, we should put you in the water supply here. Okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. God bless you. Keep up the good work. And, 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 and as you guys say around here, <laughs> if you will, it is no dream. Thank you. Right.